Good morning, St. Luke's. It is the 25th of October. We're sheltering in place. We're sheltering in God. It's week 31, and it happens to be Reformation Sunday. Do you remember the Bob Dylan song, You've Got to Serve Somebody? Well, the principle in that song originally comes from Jesus. He was the one who taught you can't serve two masters. You have to serve somebody. You can't have two loyalties. One is always going to lead. And in our text this morning, Jesus questions who or what is leading. He says that if our loyalty is misplaced, it's going to end up holding us captive. And we'll lose our inner freedom. We'll get enslaved, is the word he uses. You'll get enslaved to something that can't deliver what it promises. On the other hand, he teaches if your loyalties are in place, or if your loyalty is in place, and you are on the right track, the end result is an inner freedom. It looks like peace. It looks like love. It looks like self-control and kindness. He's talking about an inner sense of being. If the sun sets you free, he says, you shall be free indeed. The Gospel reading today is from John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Good morning, children of St. Luke's. Today we celebrate Reformation Sunday. A man named Martin Luther thought it was very important for everyone to be able to read the Bible and to teach their children what it says. So he translated the Bible. It was written in Greek and in Latin. That is how the Bible is now like a symbol of freedom, because it means that we can all read it and know the stories of God. The cross is another symbol of freedom. In today's gospel, Jesus says, the truth will make you free. We all sin, we're not perfect, but he came to make us free. Jesus went to the cross for you and me and all people. So the cross is a symbol of that freedom that we have through Jesus. It is freedom to love one another, to help one another, and to tell the stories of the Bible to show God's love for the world. So let's thank God for that. Dear God, thank you for keeping our families and our friends safe and healthy. Thank you for the freedom that we have. And thank you for helping us to share that freedom to know you to others. In Jesus' name, amen. So today is Reformation Sunday, and throughout the life of the church overall, actually even before the church existed, um, there's always been reformers. In the Old Testament, they were called prophets. But since the beginning, uh, there's always been people calling for change, calling to get back to what's truly important. And we happen to remember one particular reformer, Martin Luther. 1546, I always like to add that because I know that's confusing for some people because they think, oh, it's Martin Luther King. No, not Martin Luther King. Martin Luther, 1546, German monk, looked at the church of his day, which of course was uh, Roman Catholic, and began to see glaring inconsistencies in the teachings of the church in comparison to the teachings of scripture. And in other words, he looked at the church of his day and he, there was no scriptural basis for some of the things that the church was doing. And this is really what started off the reform, the reformation. 
he saw things like um, one of the teachings was uh, if, if you write a big check out to the church your sins will be forgiven you can do whatever you want it doesn't matter it's not important no worries you can pay for all your indulgences and uh, carry on with life well obviously there's absolutely nothing in that there's nothing in scripture like that and so luther saw he began to see all these inconsistencies in the church and of course people were led astray which is actually understandable in those days because you know at that time 500 years ago people couldn't read the bible for themselves i mean when luther was in the church everything was said in latin so the common people couldn't possibly read anything and check things out for themselves actually many of them couldn't read so they just obeyed the church the church had a lot of authority in that in those days at that time and if that's what the church said well okay it must be true here's the money you know handing over their money and so luther one of the things he questioned was that whole business of indulgencies but also there were many other things too so in our passage this morning jesus is doing exactly what luther did exactly what the prophets did in the old testament people like jeremiah and elijah and isaiah the prophets were always looking out onto the land looking out over the people and seeing inconsistencies and calling them out on it and this is what Jesus is doing in our passage this morning. Now, again, I've mentioned this before. It's always good to notice the context and who he is talking to. Uh, he's talking to people who say they follow. They say that they're disciples. But Jesus sees, when he looks at them, he sees some inconsistencies and he calls them out on it same thing as luther same thing as all the other reformers same thing as the prophets of the old testament so that's the context of this he um look at verse 31 we're in john 8 31 so the jewish believers who had believed in him jesus said if you hold on to my teaching, you're truly my students. I mean, if you're truly my disciples, if you're truly my students, you will hold on to my teaching, meaning you'll, you'll walk the talk, you'll do it. Now remember, he's in conversation with people who claim to follow him, but they've either fallen away or they're not interested, but something's happened. And then in verse 1, he's... 31 he says if you continue in my word if you carry on living this way you're truly my disciples and the truth will set you free now that's a key verse there the truth will set you free here's another version of this this is from eugene peterson if you stick with this jesus is saying living out what i tell you you're my disciples for sure the truth will set you free so there's something about the way that these so-called disciples are living that isn't free jesus is noticing something about them something's wrong he said if you truly follow me you're going to have some freedom about you and i'm not seeing a whole lot of freedom in your life i'm seeing something else and then he goes on to say in fact everyone who sins is a slave of sin and of course naturally enough his listeners begin to get offended what do you mean 33 what do you mean set free we are not slaves to anyone. We're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves. We're not slaves. And again, Jesus said, you're a slave to sin, verse 34. If the Son sets you free, 
you shall be free indeed. Now that's the text. So again, he, he's speaking to people who, maybe they're half-hearted followers, maybe they started strong and dropped back, which is very, very common because it's hard to be faithful over the long haul. And that's the same, the same is true today, you know. Many people, when they first start off, are really keen. You know, they're sort of sitting on the edge of their seat and they're really keen, and then a few years down the road, uh, it changes, and some drop out. I've seen this over the years. So these people claim to follow him, but there's something about their way of living, something about their way of thinking, something about their way of thinking about God, or it could be their behavior that is offensive to Jesus. We, we, we're not sure what it is. But he speaks to them bluntly that you're dominated by the wrong things, or you are led by the wrong things, or you are loyal to the wrong things. All of these would work. And then he says, you're dominated by sin. Now that's an interesting word because it, when you translate that from the New Testament to English, it means you're off target. You've missed the mark. So if you're sinning, you're you're missing the mark. You're off target in some way. So if your spiritual life isn't, isn't helping you, if it's not helping you grow in grace and grow in love and grow, grow in compassion for yourself, for others, then something's wrong. There's, there's a freedom missing. Very easy for people to get off track and get dominated or Jesus' word, enslaved he liked that word enslaved you can get enslaved by the wrong things or influenced by the wrong things or led by the wrong things but actually one of the most common things that we become enslaved to dominated by and overwhelmed by is our way of thinking we can, be, we can become addicted to the way we think, meaning we think the way that we think is the right way. That's the problem with much of humanity. And we're unwilling to change because we get so locked into one way of thinking, one way of doing things, and then we never reflect. Jesus would say, that's questionable. That sounds a little bit like a loss of freedom. And Luther is a great example before his God encounter. I mean, before his major aha moment God encounter. He's a really great example of being enslaved or dominated by the wrong thing because this guy was absolutely enslaved to guilt. He felt guilty all the time. Now, this is after he's a monk. So this is after he's had all his theological education. This is after he's actually serving the church. He was so dominated by guilt that he suffered a lot from a depression. He never felt good enough. He never felt right before God. And, you know, at one point in his life, apparently, history tells us, he's going to confession up to 20 times a day. Can you believe that? 20 times a day, he's going to confession and he's reminding himself, and reminding God all what's wrong. It's a terrible, terrible bur burden. I mean, no wonder he's uh, depressed. He was absolutely dominated by feelings of unworthiness, feelings of low self-esteem. And, and this is before God and, and with people. I mean, he's just miserable until he had that aha moment with God, which is interesting when it happened. He had his aha moment when he was reading scripture. And he read a text that he had read a hundred times before, you're saved by grace. And for, this is, isn't this the way God works with us? For some reason on one particular day, the light bulb was switched on and it was like, oh, you mean it's not up to me to perform perfectly before I'm okay before God? It was like, yeah, yeah. So you don't have to feel guilty about not getting it right all the time. 
changed his life. Absolutely. He said it was like being born again, because it was. It was a, a new kind of freedom he had never, ever experienced before. So, yeah, freedom. He found a new kind of freedom, and this is what this text is all about. It's the same thing. It's the same theme of, of freedom. Now, maybe you don't worry about guilt. That's Luther's. That was Luther's problem. Maybe that's not something that, I don't know, just takes away your freedom or destroys your freedom, reduces your freedom. Maybe it's not guilt. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe you worry about the future. And that would be, you know, the area, yeah, you'd say, if I'm going to lose my freedom anywhere, if I'm going to get all depressed, or if I'm going down, it's because, of, because I'm worried about the future. Or, there's so many things we can be addicted to in our thinking. Maybe you're stuck in the past. You're always, you know, you're regretting the past or you're wishing you were in the past. And that's what takes away your freedom today. Um, maybe it's anger. You're constantly frustrated. You're constantly angry because you can't get on. That's the thing that takes away your freedom. You see, we all have different things. We all have different weaknesses or frailties that keep revisiting us and they come back and I think that the reason that things come back is for another layer of healing we spoke about this on Wednesday night at our study which I thought was interesting that it came up that whole idea that you know just because we're set free in one area doesn't necessarily mean it won't come back in a year or two or three and again, we revisit that wound and another piece of healing comes down through the years. Another piece comes. God's always moving us to our freedom. If you ever wonder, I don't know what God is doing. I don't know how God is leading. Choose the path that leads to freedom, a lightness of spirit. If it's oppressive, if it's heavy, if, it, if it's anxiety producing, it's not the leading of the spirit. It's not the leading of the spirit. It's another leading. So again, your troubles might not be anything like Martin Luther. It might not be guilt. Maybe you're melancholy. Maybe you, I don't know, maybe you have trouble with gossip or bitterness or people pleasing. Maybe you're exhausted people pleasing or exhausted always trying to improve yourself in some way or maybe you do other things that are compulsive like eating or drinking I mean there's so many things we can get caught up in Jesus is saying it doesn't matter what you're caught up in what you need to know is I'm the one that sets you free and then there's that famous line if the sun sets you free you shall be free indeed so it's like, take a look at what's holding you back. Take a look at what keeps tripping you up because we're going to get you some freedom here. That's what this text is about. I think this is what Jesus is saying for those who have ears to hear. Um, and freedom's a, it's never necessarily a straight, clear path. You know, sometimes freedom comes slowly. Oftentimes freedom comes slowly. Sometimes it comes quickly, okay? Uh, sometimes, occasionally, like Luther, the light will go on and it's like, oh, okay, I don't have to be concerned about that anymore, it's over. But oftentimes freedom seems to come in increments, at least that's been my experience. Um, for example, when you're forgiving someone or forgiving yourself, oftentimes it will be slow to come over a period of time. It isn't necessarily just one day you're burdened with 
uh, resentment and then the next day you're totally free and you're fine. Usually it takes a little time. But Jesus is saying, what I'm doing in your life is what the Spirit of God is doing in your life. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So he's always talking about, Jesus is always teaching transformation. What is faith all about? What is faith? It's always about transformation. Like if you had a neighbor that had no clue about your faith at all, and they said to you, well, what is, it, what is Christianity all about? I mean, what's the point of it all? I mean, that would be a, a good line. It's about following the teachings of Jesus that ultimately, when followed, lead to inner transformation and change, which looks a lot like freedom. That would be a little, you know, capsulization of, of the faith. You know, if people aren't interested in inner transformation, if they're not interested in becoming all they were created to be, if they're not interested in change, not going to be that interested in following Christ. Because that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Uh, Jesus didn't have much patience for those who claimed to be following. And then there's nothing particularly Christ-like about them. I mean, he had no patience for that. Most of his arguments were with religious leaders who were not interested in transformation. They liked to do the religious things and the rituals and the talk, but they didn't really want to look at themselves. He had no patience for that. Absolutely none. So a question in a text like this is always, you know, it's a bit of self-reflection, as they all are, but the question to ponder would be, is, is there anything that steals my freedom? Now it's probably already, you probably already know what it is because we're wired this way. We already know the things that steal our freedom. It's not so much a matter of knowing, it's a matter of follow through. Are we actually going to do something about it? That's where it gets hard. But the first question would always be, is there something in my life that is stealing my freedom? Because Jesus is saying, if the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed, which means I don't have to walk around enslaved to anything. That's what he's saying. I don't have to live in this world completely dominated by something or someone uh, that isn't good and that isn't leading toward life. So it's like, well, what arises for us? What area is the spirit giving us a nudge? And again, for Luther, it was guilt. For you, it would be something entirely different. Or maybe it is guilt too. Maybe you're like Luther, right? Jesus is saying, I can, I can help you with that. I can help you with that. I can lead you into a new found freedom. You don't have to live this way. And by the way, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit. So it's not about us pulling yourself up with, by our own bootstraps and making it. This is the wonder of following Christ. I mean, we're yoked together with him, the spirit in us, helping us, enabling us. Um, it's like maybe I have to take a step towards something. Or maybe I know I ought to release something. Or maybe I know I ought to stop something. Or maybe I know I ought to begin something and stop procrastinating. Maybe I already have a little inclination of the path to freedom. And that path's going to be different for each one of us because we're all struggling with different things. But the end result is always, always freedom. So I want to encourage you with that this morning. That There's the prayer. That's the heart cry. If the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. So that is our heart cry. 
That's our prayer, God, that you come to us and help us to walk in freedom, that your spirit would come and help us to walk in freedom each day that we might not be burdened by the wrong things. Amen. like to thank everyone who has prayed for us this last week, everyone who has helped us financially this week. It's kind of amazing the way that uh, we have been provided for since our shelter in place. And uh, it's because of your faithfulness. I know that God put it on your heart to help, but nonetheless, you had to follow through and be faithful to that. So I want to thank everyone who's helped us in that way and thanks also for those of you coming on the property and watching our plants and taking care of our gardens because it's been particularly hot this month and it's it makes such a difference just to get a little help in that way too so i want to thank everyone who's come on the property and help with all the gardening this month amen <laughs>